Hello and welcome again to Rewind. I'm Elizabeth Puranam. Our task here on Rewind is to dig out some of the best and most influential films from the past decade and to find out how the story has moved on since. One of the earliest series launched here on Al Jazeera was Earthrise, a show which tackles increasingly important issues of climate change, but also tries to find good news stories wherever it can. Back in 2012, reporter Russell Beard traveled to Detroit in the heart of the USA's decaying Rust Belt, a city built on car manufacturing. He was on the trail of a growing urban farming movement aiming to change the face of Detroit and reverse decades of decay. Rewind recently returned to see how their movement progressed. But first, let's take a look at Motown to Growtown from 2012. In 1900, Detroit covered 30 square miles and was home to just 300,000 people, with an economy based on manufacturing railroad cars, farming and timber industries. Thanks to the introduction of the mass assembly line, by the 1920s, Detroit was the world capital of automotive production and America's fourth largest city. Fifty years on and things were very different. The major auto companies moved their factories out of the city to the suburbs and the workers followed. Meanwhile, the city's racial tensions were exploding into some of the bloodiest race riots in American history. Today, more than a million taxpayers have moved out of Detroit, leaving behind 40 square miles of vacant land, nearly 40,000 abandoned houses, and a municipal government struggling to pay the bills. For many, Detroit is the epitome of urban blight, but to find out how Detroit's urban environment is already showing signs of a green renewal, we head across town to Georgia Street Community Garden. Set up a few years ago by Mark Covington, urban farming pioneer and local hero. Mark. Hi, man. How are you? You didn't have to lead a neighborhood when I was younger. It was a car dealership on the, on down the street. We had restaurants, clothing stores, shoe shops. Everything you needed was right here. Over half a million Detroiters live closer to convenience stores than grocers, and with limited public transport and nearly half of the city living below the poverty line, access to healthy, affordable food is often a challenge. So, like, what if you don't drive here? and you can't get out of town to the malls. Where, where do people buy food in the city? To liquor stores, gas stations, and the little scarce markets that we, grocery stores that we do have. You know, because we do have places where people can go get food, but it's how healthy it is, you know, um, and how cheap, how economical it is for you to buy it. You know, when you could come here and you get a, you know, slice of pepperoni piece for a dollar. <laughs> This used to be houses. This is just a, a vacant street grid right now. This is incredible. 10 vacant lots or vacant houses to one inhabited house. People move to the suburbs for a better life. And the more people move away, the, the, the less tax base we have. The less tax base, less income for the, for the municipal government. Yeah, when people don't realize what a tax base really means to a city, mm -hmm. you know, um, as far as getting things done and having money to work with. So a lot of things we have to do on our own. Um, and that's even policing each other and cleaning up after each other. But this, this is where it all started. Uh -huh. um, I had lost my job in December of 2007, and I had to move back to home on Georgia Street with my mother and my grandmother. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I came out when the snow started melting and I saw all this garbage and trash piled up on the curb and in the process of cleaning it up, the, um, I said I need to put some food here. <laughs> and um, out here, you know, working, start talking to people in the neighborhood and finding out that uh, a lot of us were struggling. You know, our senior citizens were trying to choose whether they were gonna pay for their food for the month or buy medication. 
and uh, I decided to make it bigger. Everything I've done, I've tried to engage to the community. But it's easy for me because I know everybody, so. Um, hey. Have you had much help here in the garden from the city? Not really, uh, other than, because um, technically, having a community garden is illegal still. In it's the illegal? City of Detroit. Yes, growing food is technically illegal in the wow. city of Detroit. I got family that live in like Columbus, Ohio, and friends that live in Mississippi, which is a farming state. And uh, it's like, you growing food in Detroit? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, right in the middle of Detroit. You got goats and chickens in Detroit? I'm like, yeah, right in the middle of Detroit. Oh, so. I can hear them actually in the distance. Is that your chickens? That's a pheasant. That's a pheasant? Yeah. You grow pheasants as well? No, <laughs> that's the wild pheasant. What? <laughs> Are you joking me? Yeah, we got pheasants, rabbits, what? fox. If you if you took a shot right here and went right across the street, it looks like you're in the forest. <laughs> Are you a farmer now when people ask you what you do? Yeah, they say what I do, I'm an urban farmer. Mark Covington's not the only urban farmer in Detroit. In fact, he's part of a growing movement. When I started, I was growing seedlings in the house. My dining room, my living room was full of plants. Somebody sent me an email saying that um, there was a meeting of gardeners and they were telling them about the different resources that they offered. It felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulders. Wow. I was like, oh yes, I don't have to do this by myself. You know? <laughs> Mark's taking me to Earthworks, a highly productive urban agriculture and education hub that supplies would-be city farmers with everything they need from support to seedlings. Morning. I'm well, and yourself? You know, the idea is to be able to have a space where folks can learn how to grow food at a level that um, would be for their own economic interests. So if they were trying to grow it to start a farm where they made money, mm -hmm. or if they were trying to grow it at a scale in order to provide a, a really nice amount for their family. Could I introduce you guys real quick to, uh, this is Russell? Yeah. If we could find him a spot. This is part of Earthworks Agricultural Training Program, and we're learning to be um, urban farmers. So what are we working with here? This is um, pak choy. I think that's a good one. That's got some good roots on it there. Good root. I got into it because I have uh, I have young children. I wanted to be able to grow food because I think that growing your own food is one of the most revolutionary acts you can uh, participate in. And I also have a, a small vegan catering company, so wow. okay. trying to grow for production purposes. You want to make a business out of this? Yeah. Detroit is not only unhealthy uh, financially, but with health. And one of the first things that you can do to heal yourself is through your food. <laughs> So if we do it ourselves, we know what we have in our Exactly. I'm trying to be gentle with them. They're just so fragile, these little things. Well, As so Patrick would say, they had stronger than you realize. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Folks oftentimes think of the gardens as the, and the farm as being what we do, but we see it as being more like the canvas upon what we do our work. Yeah. Of that really the work is about people. These seedlings will be distributed to over a thousand families in community gardens all over the city. On the days when we pick up transplants, it's like a carnival. There's so many people. Morning, morning. How you doing, gentlemen? I know this is our hoop house. Part of it is using this as being sort of the classroom, but then showing that it can be replicated on a smaller level. You know, you can go out to the hardware store and do this instead of being dependent. It's one thing being able to provide the food, but do you think people would start eating more fresh fruit and vegetables if it was available? As a country, we do not grow enough fresh fruits and vegetables for what we're supposed to be eating. So that capacity has to ramp up, that we have to be growing new farmers that are growing fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the flip side of that is how do we get folks to eat fresh fruits and vegetables? I think it's relationship-based. And I think for most of the folks you talk to that find this work very sacred, almost always there's gonna be some sort of memory attached to it. It might be way back in the back of their mind, but when you start asking them, they'll almost say, you know, it's because of a parent or grandparent or my neighbor taught me how to do this, and we carry that with us still. This is my friend, Edith Floyd. Uh -huh. She's um, one of the pioneers in Blotty, or taking over vacant lots and, and growing food. Hello. How are you doing? How, how you are been? you? I haven't seen you in a while. Wow. Yeah. This is Where's Russ. Hi, Hi Edith. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Edith moved to Detroit as a child, and in her 40 years living on Mount Olivet Street, she's seen a lot of changes. So how many houses used to be on this street? 64. 64. Mm -hmm. 
And I can count one, two, three, There's four, six. five, six. Literally, just six you can see from here. We adopt this first lot right here. Okay. And when the next house got torn down, we adopted the next lot. Wow. And then we kept on going until we got down to Van Dyke. So how many, how many lots have you adopted so far? Just 28. Just 28. What's this? Gooseberries. Wash your fingers, the pickery bush. Yeah. They are delicious. Mmm. Oh, red gooseberries. Mm-hmm. Mm mmm. Wow, this looks great. And what do you think, Mark? What do you reckon to all this land? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of <laughs> work. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it's fun. Oh, I yeah, like it is. It. I it's like uh, it. I always say I get tired, but it's a good tired. Not content with utilizing Detroit's Adopt-A-Lot program that allows residents to lease abandoned properties for personal use, Edith plans to turn the whole street into a drive through fruit market. And if they want, they can get out and pick it themselves, or if they call me a day before, I have it ready. Do you believe that this is, that you're going to be able to manage that? I mean... Yes, it's easy. All you got to do is have the equipment. You can zip through here in no time. Edith got the grant money she needed to buy the tractor by volunteering to maintain the local park. Just think, I was cutting it with a push lawnmower. It wow. burned up. We burned up about two or three lawnmowers. Then I said, this is not working. We have to get a tractor. I can't believe this. Just remember, we're in the middle of Detroit. OK. OK, so we're going to do some tilling here. Now, where am I going? It ain't going Unless you put your foot on the gas. Well, you did a good job. <laughs> good farmer. <laughs> <Good farmers. laughs> and thanks to this, you can turn that wasteland, that tall grass, into, into productive farmland. Right, and into a timely fashion. Because I could plow it and plant this whole thing in one day. Yeah. That's how fast it is. And you think there's a real need for that in Detroit right now? Yes, because right now, I can't walk to the grocery store. It's so far apart. You can go to the gas station to get junk, but to get fresh food, it's nowhere, nowhere around here. Mm. At least you got to go seven miles or five or six miles, to, miles to get the food you need. It's so much land here. Why just let it sit here and go to nothing? I'd rather work with the land than to work against the land. I, I like to um, use the land as my friend. It feeds people. It'll take care of you if you take care of it. Oh, baby, one more lonely night. After decades of urban decay, the city's getting back on track with improvements to public transport services and the installation of thousands of energy efficient streetlights. Despite being on the brink of bankruptcy, inner city investment has totaled over $9 billion since 2006 as entrepreneurs hustle to stake a claim in the city while it's still going cheap. The last 10 years saw a 59% rise in young graduates moving into the city's core, reinventing downtown as an arts and cultural hub, while on the outskirts, a new wave of urban farmers is also arriving. OK, so it's the last day in Detroit. Um, the sun's not come up yet, very early. Come to meet Carolyn Ledley. She runs Rising Pheasant Farms, a food producer here in the city. And it's market day, so we come to give her a hand. Hi, Carolyn. Russell, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I had heard about the urban ag scene here uh, about 16 years ago, which was much smaller than it is now. It wasn't getting national publicity and all of that. Um, urban ag scene, I love yeah. that. <laughs> the urban agriculture yeah, yeah, um, but... world here. We take everything to Eastern Market um, by bike, and with I'm the trailer, for, I, I don't go off I haven't seen many bikes that. around the city. It's mostly big trucks. Yeah. <laughs> big cars. Yeah. People love their cars in Detroit. I mean, it's Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> it's still Detroit. Um, yeah. People want to rebrand it as this, you know, you know, green place and blah, 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 which is great. And it people are kind of taking on that mentality more, but it's still Detroit, and it's still always going to have the big cars um, until there's no more oil. Yeah. <laughs> and then people have to figure out something else. Look at that sunrise. Yes. I've never heard so many birds in the city before. This is beautiful. 
We don't use any kind of chemical fertilizers or sprays or anything, so just lots of compost and hard work. Just kind of give it a tug. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this garlic's been saved in Detroit for about seven years now. So it does better and better each year because you're selecting the ones that do the best. <laughs> That's Detroit grown garlic. Oh, my goodness, I've just noticed your tattoo. Wow, this... you really love garlic, don't you? <laughs> does it match? Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> I think it's that one. They're living some kind of new urban dream here. And who's Thank this you. little one? Oh, yeah, this is Finnegan. Finnegan. But yeah, most of the folks that still live here now kind of have been through hell and back, you know, in this neighborhood with crack issues and drugs and gangs and whatever. And so I feel like the folks that are here now are probably not going anywhere. They've kind of... They're pretty resilient. Everything. I mean, I think that we need to slowly transition to a, a smaller scale, more sustainable agriculture. And I think pretty you know, soon that, like, economically, it just won't make sense to grow the way we do now. You know, our, well, our whole entire society is completely reliant on the fact that oil is cheap. Yeah. So once that one element isn't so cheap anymore, I mean, everything will change. And I think our culture has taught people that, you know, you should have whatever you want. You know, TV tells you, you buy, buy, buy. And that's just not the reality when you live in a lower resource economy. You know, you have to support each other. You have to work together. You got to share resources. And that's what Detroit is doing, you know. The Eastern Market is one of the largest open-air markets in the United States, and it's been growing steadily despite Detroit's suburbanization. It's all about knowing your farmer. Very important to know where your food's coming from, you know? Have you got a preferred stacking method? I probably do. Farmers are pretty particular. We're up against some serious competition yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. Is... Detroit's probably a little behind the times when it comes to, like, the whole food, local food thing, and especially the organic thing, but I feel like it's changing every year, you know? Flower shoots or our pea shoots? I'll take some pea shoots. Where's the farm? Uh, we're about uh, two miles from here. You're buying stuff in season here, or instead of stuff that's being trucked in from from who knows how far, and and it might it might have something on it you don't want to eat, but you'll never know. Every Saturday, about 45,000 people come here to do the shopping. Some community here. If you spend enough time down here, you get to know your sellers, you get to know your farmers. Good morning. How are you? And did you pick these yourself? This morning, it took me forever. I love it. I love to go around and look and see what they have. Some, some of them let you taste everything. It's nice. I learn a lot every time I come. Yes. You make a few dollars as well? A few dollars to put gas in the tractor. That's good enough for me. <laughs> hey, Mark. What do you think about these? Have you, have you seen these? Yeah. How's it sound? Yeah, it's going good. We try, you know, got a little more diversity than we have in the past, but yeah, it's going pretty good. The biggest challenge in the city here is land. It's shocking when there's so much land you think available that the city owns that they're not really doing anything with and can't maintain. Yeah. But it's just caught up in that bureaucracy, and meanwhile, we're kind of doing it under the radar a little bit. Hopefully, we'll, you know, get around to the city promoting this and, and supporting it as opposed to being a, a barrier. So. We, um, we painted almost this picture of victimization. We started talking about these food deserts. The exact opposite is what a lot of community gardeners and food activists are saying is, no, we don't need outside interests. We have the capacity to, to care for ourselves in that, of that we know what's best for the community. Um, and I certainly think Mark is a, is a stunning example of it. Yeah. When you've literally seen people move into your neighborhood because of what you're doing, you know? And so that not a lot of folks can claim a, a neighborhood is, is seeing um, people moving into it. I'd rather see a bunch of houses, a bunch of people, um, but, you know, even in the future, I would like to see uh, some of the vacant lots, or all the vacant lots, you know, have houses and apartment buildings on them with people walking around. But I still think we, we, even in that future, we'll need something like this so we can grow our own food. I think ultimately, nature will heal itself. I think that when we look at it on these lots that we refer to as being vacant, which is a highly anthropocentric viewpoint of that they're not in fact vacant, they're full of all kinds of life, but those plants I think are really healing the soil. And that, that ultimately is the legacy that we provide to our children and our grandchildren is that we have taken these soils that have been um, wasted and to allow them to re-flourish. 
everything has a seed. You know, everything grows from a seed and it had to start somewhere, so. Motown to Grow Town from the Earthrise series back in 2012. So how did they get on in the years since then? Rewind producer Gia Uleri retraced Russell's steps recently to find out. This morning I start at five. When, when I can see outside, then I start. I like to plow and I like to work in the garden. 70 year old Edith Floyd's dream of a drive through market never came to fruition. The size of her urban farm has grown from nine lots to 32. And she's also added a large hoop house so she can now grow fruit and vegetables all year round. We have broccoli, pallets, green peppers and celery. If you don't work, you don't eat. And if you don't work, you get lazy and don't want to do nothing. Work keep me going. I like working. A few miles away, Mark Covington and his mother Lorraine have also grown their urban farm complete with more animals. I want to say we only had eight lots, and now we have 24 that we either keep cut or we grow something on. The reason why we got these was to help pollinate our fruit trees and our, uh, the crops that we grow. You know, we had beautiful plants, but they weren't producing a lot of fruit. We tripled, easily tripled that with, when we started keeping bees. Easily. I mean, the last six years have been boom. Edith has plans to expand the farm so people can come and pick their own fruit and veg. In the future, I would like this to be a farm in the city. I want to grow fresh vegetables enough that a store would come over and get the vegetable fresh. Edith gets help on the farm via the court system. People can do their hours of community service instead of paying a fine or going to prison. It's called volunteer hours. The people who need volunteer hours, they could come and do their volunteer hours over here because we grow food for the food bank. Many of the vacant houses and lots surrounding Mark's urban farm are still up for sale. However, he's purchased one of them, which they'll turn into a community education centre. In the meantime, they've added a hoop house to their lot so they can grow tomatoes in the winter. So we have our turkey giveaway every year. Um, we do 30 to 35 turkeys and with a basket. So we have put kale and collards and string beans in with it. Uh, along with some other donations that we get. This is an asset to the city, not just the, the neighborhood, but the city. When I get 110, I want to be on this tractor, plowing. <laughs> Being out here in the soil, learning about health by eating good, um, it, it's changed my life. I, I, I can't imagine doing something else. These urban farmers from Detroit have not yet transformed Motown to Growtown, but the seeds they and others have sown promise a rich and fruitful harvest in the years to come. Well, that's it from us. Don't forget, you'll find more films from the series on the Rewind page at aljazeera.com. But for now, thank you for joining us and see you again next time.